Okay, here we are. This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks Podcast. My name is Jay Brown. If you're new today, welcome to you. And just thanks to everyone for listening. I'm, I'm in a bit of a situation this week. You see, I'm not really feeling inspired to record this intro right now. I've had a really difficult few days. Yesterday especially seems to be spilling over into today. I don't even feel like I could talk about it right now because I'm still in it. And it's moments like this where I think you could just take the week off, man. You don't have to put out an episode. It would be fine, you know. But then <laughs> it makes me feel so shitty that I, I don't. It would make me feel worse. Like it's supposed to give me space that I need. But if it creates <laughs> like something in me that makes more anxiety, it's not helpful. And so here I am in a very empty uninspired state trying to introduce this week's episode and (laughs) in a way it's strangely fitting my guest Sophie Strand I don't think that she'll mind (laughs) that this is happening the way that it is in some way it's, it's in the spirit of some of the things that she writes about Sophie is an amazing writer who has inspired me and is talking about animism in a way that feels important to me. Those of you who've been listening to the show, you know I've been talking about animism ever since Joshua Shry was here. And Sophie, I don't know, she's putting ideas together with storytelling and myth and science in a way that feels empowered and, like I said, important. So I, I'm not going to lie. I think I might have been just a tad bit starstruck. I don't, that's not usual for me, but I, I really, I'm, I'm a very big fan of her writing and, It was a real pleasure that she accepted my invitation and we managed to find this moment to connect. And it is really just my pleasure to also share it with you today. Real quick before we do that, you know I like to send some love to podcast premium subscribers because they're an important part of this show and why it's so important to me to make it happen every week. So let me shout out specifically this week, Emma Slightholm and Julia Hadlin. Emma and Julie, longtime supporters of this show, thank you both so much. If you're new around here and you enjoy what you're hearing and you want to support it, or you want to also get access to the full archives, the way to do that is a premium subscription It's choose your rate. You cancel any time. And if you don't have money and you want to get to the old episodes, you just email us and we will definitely give you a free account. But if you are able to contribute something, it it's what sustains the show and keeps us going. And we're grateful. So if you want to learn more about becoming a podcast premium subscriber or find any of my other ongoing stuff, I've got live classes you can do and on-demand videos that you can check out and a whole bunch of stuff. So if you want to check out any of my stuff, go to jbrownyoga.com. All right, y'all. That's just going to have to do. This conversation with Sophie stands on its own, so let's just get to it, okay? I will touch base with you on the other side. But for now, let's listen to this conversation that I had with Sophie Strand. Hello? Can you hear me now? I can hear you fine. Can you hear me okay? Can indeed. 
Well, hello, Sophie. I'm Jay. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Jay. Thank you for rescheduling and also for inviting me on. Oh, it's really my pleasure. And I just want to let you know, I, I, I am already recording and I'd like to consider us having already begun, if that's okay with you. That's fine by me. Cool. Well, I really appreciate you uh, giving me this time and rescheduling and making it happen. You know, I, I'm just a huge fan. I've, I've been really uh, moved and inspired by your writing. So it's just like a, a real pleasure for me to get this chance to connect with you. Thank you for it. Thank you. I mean, the writing is all about the connection with other people. So I'm always happy when it works. <laughs> Well, it certainly has with me. And, you know, it's, it's on a lot of different levels. And I was just like sitting here, you know, the biggest challenge of this show is always like trying to find a place to start with people. And for you, I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble because there's so many things that I want to uh, talk to you about today. But I guess one place we could start, and it's, it's for you and it's for anybody listening to just have like a little bit of context as to why I invited you here. You know, I, you know, through the last few years over the pandemic and everything, something I've been talking a lot about is that as a yoga teacher before the pandemic, a lot of us were sort of like looking to science to lend credibility to what we were doing. So there was a lot of talk of, vagal tone and connective tissue was like a huge thing. There's all this new science about fascia as an organ. And everybody was like really getting into fascia as a, a concept or as like a inquiry point. And I think that those kinds of lenses were, were selling very well. Also like it, it appealed to the masses or the public in a way more so than other more like contemplative aspects of yoga that ultimately when the last few years came down and I really had to evaluate for myself, what, what is it that I offer as a yoga teacher that really helps me or what is it about my yoga practice that is really most needed right now? And it wasn't about a science lens, you know, it was about some kind of recognition in myself that I don't have control and that there are forces bigger than me at work. And that actually, in trying to talk about that, it kind of brought the conversation into this like religious place, it seemed like. And I got into yoga to get away from religion, like as a rejection of Judeo-Christian religions that I was born into. And so I've been talking about that more and more. And that's how I found my way to this word animism. And just like a big, huge shout out to Joshua Shry and the Emerald podcast, because it was hugely important for me to find him in that show. And that's how I, I discovered you because this term animism seemed to like be what I had experienced or what seemed to be capturing my attention and feel really important and seemed to be fundamental to yoga too, in a lot of ways. So in any case, that's like the initial entry point for me to you, this idea of animism. But then I got into your writing and I remember when that book, the secret life of trees came out a little while ago or whatever it was. And it talked about how like mycelium networks in the soil were the communication system for the trees in the forest. And I don't know. I, I read all the stuff that you wrote about fungal gods. <laughs> and so ultimately even one last layer to just throw in over the last month, since we rescheduled, you sent out this one email, um, this piece entitled the body is a doorway. And, you know, right now my daughter, she's seven. And in the last three months, like her, her mental health, I guess it, it it seemingly collapsed <laughs> and she's been, you know, dealing with uh, severe obsessive compulsive behavior. And, and I really know from what I've been able to get from her so far that it is about like the trauma of the last two years, I think a lot of it. 
So I've been like thinking about this word neurodivergent that you hear thrown around so much. And so I'm, I'm kind of rambling all around, but just to kind of show you the kind of, kind of many layers, I'm sure you can see how there's like a lot of connections to the things that you've been writing and all of that. So it's almost too much and I don't even know where to begin, I guess, to start for the people listening can you, do you mind sharing something about um, the diagnosis that you were given and in terms of this connective tissue disorder that you have and when you first noticed that starting to happen for you or when you first started to notice symptoms of that? Definitely. And also just want to honor, thank you for rooting me in your own experience and love to your daughter. I can't imagine what it would be like to be a young person right now, just in terms of everything happening. Um, so to offer some um, placement in my, my bodily, my somatic history, um, the truth is that it's always under revision. So I do think this story of my health is, is even today in the past two months changed um, I was a very active kid. There were some weird things that happened with me physically, but no one ever really noted them. Um, like my ribs, I, I, when I hit puberty, when I hit like 10, my ribs started to float out and dislocate and do strange things called floating rib syndrome. Um, and I was having rib issues um, my feet would be very red. I would have, I would pass out and faint. So I, there were, there were strange things when I was growing up, but they didn't really impact my quality of life or my athleticism. Um, but when I was 16, I fell pretty much overnight, dramatically life-threateningly ill. Um, my gastrointestinal system broke down. My organs started to malfunction. Um, my joints started popping in and out. I was experiencing com like complete system shutdown and spent the next seven years in and out of the hospital and in and out of specialist offices and received many different diagnoses and experimental treatments that didn't work <laughs> um, and didn't hold. And it finally became clear that I have a genetic connective tissue disease that predisposes me to a blood condition and to autoimmunity. What of course is also more complicated is underneath all of these stratigraphic layers of diagnosis and symptoms is the fact that I'm a survivor of early childhood abuse, which we now know um, predisposes people to um, autoimmunity and extraordinary health issues. So I can see that there's, there are, there's a tangled web behind my physical experience but yeah um at 16 i became very ill and have been ill since then i'm 28 now um and it has been a tricky and interesting collaboration with indigestion and immovability um, it is a condition without a cure and without real solid pain management or treatment so it takes a lot of um a lot of spontaneity and creativity to deal with. Yeah, I guess that's, I don't know. It seems to me having just only recently uh, had an, something come into my life or my daughter's life that it just sort of takes over everything. You say like it happened overnight. That's kind of what it felt like. Like there was some early signs of things with her, but nothing that felt like it was a problem, but literally overnight it was like a switch got flipped and I'm wondering, was there, do you, was there like some kind of specific trigger or you literally just randomly one day woke up that way? Um, there was, I hesitate to talk about it just because it's very specific to my medical treatment to doctors and I mean, the one thing I will say is my experience of, 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 the industrial medical complex has been very poor and I've received very bad treatment over the years. That has probably worsened my condition because doctors are lazy and don't pay attention and don't pay attention, especially to women and um, minorities health. 
um, and their symptoms. So I will say that the trigger was um, very bad medicine <laughs> um, and a bad choice done by a lazy doctor that seems to have acted as a real trigger for this genetic condition kicking in with incredible severity. I mean, it may have always kicked in at around 16. It seems that with, for people with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, that it does seem to manifest around puberty. So I also can see that there are so many different arrows in the target. You know, it's a multi-causal event. Hard to know what exactly caused it. Yeah, I know. We've had some of like the nature nurture conversation on the show before. And it's like we, with my daughter, it's, you could see like, oh, I can, um, I wouldn't want to attribute it all to what's happened over the last two years. You know, certainly I, I can see she had early tendencies. You can see things early on in people when you look back in retrospect, but at the same time, it most certainly seems to have been triggered by the traumas of the last two years. Um, and I've, I've been, having to navigate what you call the industrial medical complex myself. And I'm very uh, fortunate. We've managed to find like one or two really good people who are working within that system to try to help us, you know, and navigate it. But it, it's really dehumanizing and it, and they don't know what to do a lot of times except hand out medications and you know, the efficacy of that. I mean, like that, we're certainly not taking it off the table. We don't take anything off the table, but it's, it, it's amazing and disheartening and uh, soul crushing when you come up against like the inhumanity of our healthcare system. It's real bad. It really is. And my heart goes out to you managing it as a parent of a child. Um, I mean, I think that when illness hits, it's not an individual experience. It, it's a territory that families enter. And I think that that's something we really have to start understanding is like when someone gets sick, their whole family is in it with them and experiencing it and navigating it. Mm -hmm. And I can't, I saw how stressful and upsetting it was for my parents to feel that they were, um, their attempts to make me feel better were futile they couldn't find me proper care. The doctors they did get me to would ultimately do very problematic things. And I saw that that was heartbreaking for them. So I can only imagine what you're navigating right now as you attempt to both heal and protect your daughter. Yeah. And there is like a range of things we're trying to do to do this, that one, take care of ourselves because it really impacts our mental health <laughs> and just everything the way the world is, you know, on some level, it's like, I look at my daughter screaming and raging. And part of me is like, that's actually a very appropriate response yeah. <laughs> you know, like to everything that's happening in the world than what we did to our kids over the last few years. But at the same time, she's suffering so much, you know? So yeah. in, in wanting to, do whatever I can, which sometimes feels like not a lot. I had to, I'm certainly having to look at the Western medicine and see what it offers. Cause it's like, I don't want to be irresponsible. And there's, there are potential, there's potential help to be had there. And you got to try to do something it seems like, but at the same time, as I started this conversation, the thing that's really been healing me or feels like that more has been, not looking to science and medicine so much as like nature and innate wisdom or something. And it, it seems like that was part of your process too. Can you talk a little bit about when you started to make connection between fungi organisms <laughs> and your own health journey? Oh uh, yeah. Um, I can. Um, I've always loved mushrooms and I grew up in the Hudson Valley in New York state in a pretty, in the shadow of a mountain on a lot of wild land. My parents, you know, had us in the dirt from a young age onwards. And so I spent a lot of time looking at fungi and rootlets and dirt and moss and, um, feeling that they, um, 
they straddled um, the good and the bad. They kind of flipped human morality. You know, some fungi are edible, some are deeply poisonous. They're very much like fairies, which is capricious, not really interested in human affairs. And when they do meddle with human affairs, it's oftentimes in very questionable ways. Um, you can get sent into so, spiritual realms through psychedelic you know, or, or your kidneys can shut down. Yeah. And you have to be very careful. Yeah. Um, but I love them and I was a I was always an amateur mycophile you know figuring out what they did what types of fungi were around me but in college it was very interesting I came up across the um philosophy of Deleuze and Guattari and their idea of the rhizome was being a, a way of of looking at systems as being non-hierarchical with multiple doors of entry as narratives of uh, that were non-linear and I was finding that to be very interesting, yet a little sterile, <laughs> ecologically sterile. Mm. Um, and so I was like, can we can we compost this philosophy with actual mycorrhizal systems? Because I was learning at that point that while mushrooms look like individuals, they're really these reproductive flourishes above ground of much larger systems below ground that connect forests and orchids and grasses and facilitate conversations and are highways for bacterial colonies. So I was thinking about mycorrhizal systems a lot at the very moment that I received my connective tissue diagnosis finally. And I think that aha moment that felt very synchronous was when I realized that I was fascinated with the connective tissues of forests, the mycorrhizal systems, and I had an insufficiency of connective tissue in my own body. And that somehow this, this lack, this perceived absence in my body was maybe the opening for me to connect in with a more than human connective tissue. And so something that was a problem could also be a portal. Mm. Yeah, that's beautiful. And it, it's so interesting. I had someone on the show a few weeks back or a month or two ago, I think, uh, named Frey Faust. He invented something called the, the axis syllabus. And we huh. were specifically talking about connective tissues. And he was talking about, I was talking about how I overstretched them in my body in the name of abstract spiritual ideals. <laughs> and, he, and he talked about how overstretching connective tissues can inhibit your uh, ability to propriocept that like that the connective tissues in your body are this communication systems in your body. And that seems to me what, what you're saying about like these uh, fungi systems underground, like they're these connective tissue communication systems. Yeah. And they also blur the line between species and between individuals. You know, when you have, millions of cells where the nuclei are supracellular, which means they're not strictly inside of one cell, they travel between cells. And then those, those filamentous hyphal networks of cells branch out and fuse into the rootlets of different species. And then those species are pollinating each other. I like, I like to sometimes say like, when you have a fungal system connecting a whole forest when one species mates, how many species are involved in the lovemaking act? Like, like where does the one species end and the other begin when they're mutually constituted? Um, so I think that they're really helpful at kind of problematizing our idea that minds live in the brain, that minds are a attribute of the brain and that um, there is such a thing as a neatly bounded individual. Wow. I mean, that's, that's a really intense concept. I just had my friend Amy Matthews on. She's this like deep somatic mover. And she was talking about this same thing about like not seeing ourselves as individual in the same way. Or and I've been talking about that. Even when you look at animism as an idea that you're, we're not at the top of the pyramid, you know, and, and the experience of that is a real, um, almost subversion of the most commonly held worldview that is currently predominant. Yeah, I know. It, it, it's, it seems like an important place to go right now to realize that as molecularly built human beings, our ancestors are bacteria that fuse symbiotically to form complex nucleated cells. 
that, you know, we only have placentas that create human vaginal birth through a viral in incursion that taught us how to create this syntrophoblast syn layer of the placenta, that we are viral bacterial beings, that we have more bacterial cells in our body than we do human cells. I mean, I really like the term holobiont, which is, you know, it's a whole, it's something that looks like an individual, but that is composed of many, many different beings. Mm. So, so we are all holobionts. <laughs> right. I guess it's how much of, I guess there's often like in yoga philosophy, there's sort of like this idea of individual soul, but then there's this idea of interconnectedness of all things. And I guess sometimes it's sort of hard to sort that out for ourselves. Well, I like, I think fungi offer a really helpful metaphor for that, which is that, so you are walking through the forest and you see a mushroom and it looks like an individual and you can pick it, but it is connected to this much larger body below ground. And so I do think there's something important about being a mushroom above ground, about finding out who you are individually, and that there's, you know, there are ways that you can particularly reproduce and create knowledge, but that it's also important to acknowledge that below ground, you are connected to something much bigger. I see. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And I guess the other, the other thing that I'm, I'm intrigued by, because you even just now and what you've been talking, you, you point to a lot of like science <laughs> and yet, <laughs> and yet a lot of times um, some people would look at that same science and not um, draw the like deeper, I don't know, conclusions that you're drawing <laughs> or connecting it in the same way that there's a more sort of reductionist lens. What do you, do you, what do you think is the distinction? the distinction there in terms of looking at the science as a way of bringing us into this experience that you seem to be pointing to, as opposed to a way of like removing us from it. I think that there's this idea that myth or myth and spirituality and science are um, opposed to each other. But I actually think that when you think of science less as being a religion and less of the kind of scientific approach, which or is scientism, like they call it sometimes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, theology dressed up as, you know, um, fact, mm. um, but both science and myth are actually trying to do the same thing. They're both trying to explain the earth and the phenomena around us in such a way that we can interact with it with more care. Um, you know, a myth personifies the elements while science um, uh, tries to, qual to quantitatively um, analyze them. But they're both, they both come from a very similar impulse, which is to understand and to connect. Um, I do think that science as articulated through Cartesian dualism and, you know, extractive patriarchal capitalism has become a very problematic idea. And it's, it's not a really an idea. It's more a tool. It's, it's a way of, of telling stories. And so I think for me, I, I, I think that science can give us different views into things we think we know. It can offer a defamiliarization that allows enchantment to arrive in the same way that myth can summon enchantment. Um, you know, when you're trying to explain, a, a great example I use is, you know, what some of the oldest gods and stories we have are about storm gods trying to explain weather events with divinity. And now with science, we can see actually that interestingly enough, spores produced by fungi create, they act as nuclei that create water molecules around them. And they actually facilitate cloud formation and humid rainforest environments. So spores create weather systems. And so on the one hand, you can, from a mythic perspective, say that storm gods create storms and then from a scientific perspective you can say spores sporulate storms and yet they're not mutually exclusive you know storm gods are spore gods the science and the myth can be in um conversation oh i love that <laughs> i love that so much i guess 
What I find interesting is that, you know, when you talk about myth, one of the things that has been important for me has been like finding these like languages of spirit or whatever, like more chanting mm -hmm. and poetry that, that the science lens, like you say, it, it offers some insights, but I think sometimes I felt like it sucked magic out of my experience. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. No. And I, I think that's, that's, we have to, we have to compost our science with poetry and with myth and with storytelling. And I think that it's part of the reason why people are very distrustful of science is because they can't access it. It has no magic. It has no heart. Mm -hmm. But it, it's not exclusive of that necessarily. Or I mean, like in and of itself, yeah. it's not there, but like you, I know other people who they, uh, they use science or a scientific lens as in their inquiry, but it, it's as a means for enchantment rather than disenchantment or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. It's supposed to open up the mystery. And I think that's one, that's, that's a myth that I think, unfortunately right now has become very dominant in the mainstream narrative is that science gives us facts, but it doesn't even, I mean, even gravity is a theory. People don't understand that. <laughs> like, I mean, it's a very, very useful and, probably correct theory, but it's still a theory. <laughs> um, and that science actually is about working with uncertainty, mostly asking questions and receiving answers that don't necessarily give you a whole picture. Um, and so I think that it's important to realize that science is about asking questions rather than creating controlled answers. Yeah, I think that's very important. And I also really appreciate how in the process of um, trying to uh, answer, look into these questions. One thing that you're very eloquent about, and you, you just use the word compost it, that <laughs> yeah. it just seems like the process of doing it, it, it actually is kind of gross, <laughs> you know, that like oh, yeah. we want it to be this, like the heavens open up and like the golden light shines down and we see our interconnected animism. And there is some element of that sometimes, but like, a lot of the times it's this process of like things dying and, and it's disgusting or something. Maybe you could say something about that word composting and what that means to you. Yeah. I mean, so as a survivor of abuse, as someone who has an illness that creates a lot of, um, grossness corpor corporality in my life that's really intense and as someone who's been manhandled by spiritual materialism and ideas of purity that exist both within the antibiotic culture of the medical industrial complex and also within new age spirituality i've been you know people have tried to purify me for a long time and unfortunately if those purification processes have actually created more harm than they have health um, I think that we live in, when I say antibiotic culture, I'm not necessarily talking about antibiotics. I'm talking about the idea that we can clean things up and sterilize things constantly. We can sterilize ecosystems. We can manage them. We can kill off all the bacteria in our gut again and again and again, and expect that there will be biodiversity and resilience. And I think for me, um, composting and the grossness is is actually a much more fertile place to be which is when you throw enough on the compost heap good bad you know indecipherable something will sprout mm. and oftentimes it's much hardier much more interesting than the thing you could have planned to grow <laughs> um yeah we need we we are so abstracted from waste we ship our waste out to you know, oppressed communities that we never have to deal with. We throw away our trash and then never think of it again. And the truth is that you can't disappear the body. You can't disappear the, the grossness. You have to start to collaborate with it and understand that it makes good soil when you take responsibility for it. Um, so I'm really interested in soil and compost as a metaphor, especially, you know, my, my body is breaking down. I'm in the process of decay at a much higher speed than most people in their bodies. So I have to begin to work with that decay in a way that's curious rather than frightened. 
Yeah. Isn't that the great challenge? Cause I feel that right now yeah. it's, I'm so afraid of the uncertainty and of the pain, you know, like the pain really breaks down the mentality of that the healing requires. Yeah. Um, so kind of like, that's where I feel like I have needed to turn. There's a certain faith element. Like you have to have faith in something, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess you get to decide what that is. I guess I'm curious. Um, you know, I've heard you just sort of allude to it and I think it bears relevance to some conversations we've had and even some things I've said about, like I had Michael Mead on, he talked about ordeal and initiation. Mm -hmm, Yeah. And I certainly feel like there's something to that, but you recently wrote like how you were allergic to spiritual practitioners (laughs) who suggest that your trauma was an initiation. And I'm wondering what you meant by that. I think that there's a very complicated phenomenon that happens in spiritual communities and spiritual contexts. It also happens in other places as well, where people say that you're only as gifted and as talented, or you're only the person you are because of what you went through. And that can be very harmful to people because, because that can make them feel like they had to have that happen. And it also, it's a way of justifying repeated cycles of harm <laughs> and saying that this harm is necessary. Um, so that's something that I find complicated, but I also think that it, it somehow says that, you know, an initiation is something with a beginning, a middle and an end. It's also something that usually exists in societies that, that have had an intact rooted experience in a specific ecology for a long time and there are elders who can midwife you through the birth canal those initiations and the truth is that what people are experiencing right now is not initiation and most people don't make it and i think that when you qualify something as an initiation it's because you're telling someone it's done that you survived it but the truth is people alongside me who have gone through extraordinary trauma have mostly not made it Mm. And I think that perhaps it's more important to start staying with, with, you know, the grossness, with the complexity of, of experiences that are agonizing and terrible and do not have a big, clear beginning, middle and end and survival rate. I just think that's so important because frankly, I was saying that stuff about initiation and ordeal before all this happened with my daughter. And I certainly, when it first started to happen was like, okay, I, I reach down deep in myself and I say, okay, I need faith and patience because this is, I don't know where, if there's ever an end to this anymore or whatever, you know, like it felt like this whole new jumping off, but there was this, this distinct, like what you're saying. Okay. Well, that's a nice idea that we're having these ordeals in our lives and that we're If you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.